This is video number 10 of the Aggregate Demand and Aggregate Supply series, which is part of the Unit 2.2 in the IB Economics Macroeconomics um, component. In this video, I'm going to explain equilibrium in the Keynesian model. In the previous video, I explained macroeconomic equilibrium in the new classical and monetarist model. This video will focus on equilibrium in the Keynesian model. So the learning outcomes um, for this video are to explain using the Keynesian ADAS diagram that the economy may be in equilibrium at any real level of real output where aggregate demand intersects aggregate supply. Then I'm going to explain using a diagram that if the economy, if the economy is in equilibrium at a level of output below the full employment level of output, then there's a deflationary recessionary gap. I'm going to discuss why, in contrast to the monetarist new classical model, the economy can remain stuck in a deflationary or recessionary gap in the Keynesian model. Then I'm going to explain using a diagram that if AD increases in the vertical section of the aggregate supply curve, then there is an inflationary gap. And I will discuss why, in contrast to the monetarist and new classical model, increases in aggregate demand in the Keynesian ADAS model do not need to be inflationary unless the economy is operating close to or at a level of full employment. So there's quite a lot of learning outcomes, so let's get started. So, um, in the Keynesian ADAS model, um, the economy may be in equilibrium at any level of real output where AD intersects AS. So here are three different situations of equilibrium. And in all three cases, the economy is at equilibrium because in all three cases, the aggregate demand curve intersects the aggregate supply curve. So whether aggregate demand is at AD1, this is, this is a level of equilibrium right here, or AD2, this is another level of equilibrium, or AD3, this is another level of equilibrium. So anywhere where AD intersects the Keynesian aggregate supply curve is seen as an economy being at equilibrium. Remember, Keynesians don't really distinguish much between the short run and the long run. The Keynesian ADAS model depends mainly on the existence of spare capacity in the economy. So let's have a look at this situation. Um, as you know, the vertical um, section of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve um, is at a level where output is at full employment. So this is the full employment level of output, YFE, right here. Okay. If the aggregate demand curve happens to be, if this is the level of aggregate demand, and this happens to be the equilibrium, macroeconomic equilibrium, the actual output, YE, or equilibrium output, is much less than the full employment level of output. Here, Keynesians say that there's a deflationary or a recessionary uh, gap because uh, there's a lot of spare capacity that could be filled up. Uh, actual output is very far from the full employment level of output. So Keynesians believe that an economy can actually remain stuck in this deflationary or recessionary gap right here. Why? Because the economy is still at equilibrium and they believe that it won't necessarily self-correct or move automatically towards full employment level of output, contrary to what the monetarists or the new classical economists believe. Remember, the new classical economists believe that in the long run, as long as the government just leaves the economy alone and allows markets to operate freely, um, the economy will gravitate by itself towards long-run equilibrium. The Keynesians believe that no, an economy can actually remain stuck in a deflationary or recessionary gap. So what are the implications of um, this belief by the Keynesians? Well, they believe that governments need to intervene and use demand-side policies to increase aggregate demand and close this deflationary gap by pushing output closer to the full employment level of output. So you can see here, if the government intervenes and, say, maybe cuts taxes and increases government spending or uh, lowers the interest rate, this will increase aggregate demand from AD to AD1. The curve will shift to the right. Now, due to the existence of spare capacity in the economy, producers can employ the unused factors of production to increase output without a significant increase in costs. Therefore, there's no inflationary pressure. Again, this is contrary to what the monetarists and the new classical economists believe, who believe that any attempt to influence aggregate demand, uh, to increase aggregate demand by the government, will just be inflationary and will not affect the real level of output. So you can see they have very contrasting views on the role of the government and um, the macroeconomic equilibrium. 
Now, what if aggregate demand is at a position here, AD1? Okay, so it's at a position where the actual output is closer to the full employment output YFE, but the actual output is here at YE1. Okay, uh, now here there would uh, be an inflationary gap on the other hand, because any further attempts to increase aggregate demand from say AD1 to AD2, shifted to the right, this will be inflationary. Why? Because the economy is approaching full employment and there's much less spare capacity. So in order to increase output, producers must compete for even scarcer resources. And this will raise the costs of production. So the average price level will rise from P to P1. Because there's much less spare capacity and the economy is approaching its full employment level. And this happens whenever aggregate demand happens to be closer or approaching full employment level of output. Now, what if aggregate demand is at a level where it is intersecting aggregate supply at the full employment level of output, YFE? So what if this is the initial equilibrium right here? What if this is the initial equilibrium? Well, once the economy is at the full employment level of output, YFE, and it's producing at its maximum potential output, given its current state of resources and technology, any further increases in AD will be purely inflationary and will only raise the average price level from P1, as you can see here, to P2, without any increase in real output. So there is no more, and this is, sorry, because there is no more spare capacity. As you can see here, any shift in aggregate demand from AD1 to, say, AD3 will only raise the price level but the output will not change because the economy has already reached its full employment level here on the vertical section of the aggregate supply, Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Uh, the difference between both supply curves, this is the inflationary gap. So, in contrast to the monetarist new classical model, increases in aggregate demand in the Keynesian ADAS model, they do not need to be inflationary. They're, as long as there's a lot of spare capacity and uh, the economy is operating on the horizontal section of the aggregate supply curve, uh, increases in aggregate demand will not be inflationary. But as you are operating close to or at full employment level of output, this is when it starts being inflationary. And this is why Keynesians... Um, emphasize the importance of demand-side policies. These are policies that are used to influence the level of aggregate demand. Demand-side policies can be either fiscal policies, which is the use of taxes and government spending to influence the level of aggregate demand, or monetary policies, which is the use of the interest rates in the economy and the supply of money to influence the level of aggregate demand. Now, both fiscal and monetary policies can be either expansionary, which are aimed at increasing aggregate demand, and this is to close a deflationary gap and lower unemployment and encourage economic growth, or they can be contractionary, and these are aimed at decreasing aggregate demand and hence close an inflationary gap and slow down the rate of inflation. The same with monetary policy. Monetary policy can be expansionary, which is aimed at increasing aggregate demand and lowering unemployment and encouraging economic growth, again, to close a deflationary gap, or can be contractionary monetary policy, which is aimed at decreasing aggregate demand and slowing down the rate of inflation. Now, depending on where the um, equilibrium level of output is and how close it is to the full employment level of output and how much spare capacity there is in the economy, uh, the government will choose the appropriate um, expansionary or contractionary fiscal or monetary policies. So what about changes in the long-run aggregate supply in the Keynesian model? Well, if the long-run aggregate supply increases, the impact on the economy will depend on the initial equilibrium position of the economy. If the economy is operating below full employment level of output, so it's operating on the horizontal section of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, then an increase in long-run aggregate supply will have no effect on equilibrium output. If it's operating close to or at the full employment level of output, an increase in long-run aggregate supply will help rein in the inflationary pressures of being close to or at full employment. So it will slow down the inflationary pressures or the rate of inflation. Uh, Keynesians, they do not underestimate the importance of supply-side policies in achieving economic growth. 
In fact, they actually encourage the use of supply-side policies, just like the monetarists and the new classical economists. However, they argue that the government must intervene to increase aggregate demand if the economy is operating below full employment. So they also believe in the importance, they emphasize the importance of demand-side policies that they must be used alongside with the supply-side policies in order to fully achieve a country's macroeconomic goals. Remember, new classicals and monetarists, they uh, believe supply-side policies are the most effective when it comes to achieving macroeconomic goals. Keynesians believe that demand-side policies should be used to smooth out the short-term fluctuations and to um, make the, push the economy, the aggregate demand, towards full employment, and that supply-side policies are great for the long run and for increasing long-run aggregate supply. As you can see here, the impact of an increase in long run aggregate supply will depend on the initial position. Here, because the economy is at um, AD, and this is the equilibrium level of output right here, an increase in long run aggregate supply has no real effect because the initial equilibrium is already below full employment. So this creates an even bigger deflationary gap and the government must intervene to boost aggregate demand by maybe adopting expansionary fiscal and, mon and or monetary policies. Now, what if the economy is already um, in the vertical section of the aggregate supply curve, as you see here, the intersection of AD and AS here, it's already operating at full employment. In this case, the increase in long run aggregate supply will reduce the inflationary pressures of being at full employment, and this will bring the average price level down. As you can see, the average price level goes down because the long run aggregate supply has increased. And this is the effect of increasing in long-run aggregate supply. Remember, Keynesians emphasize the importance of using demand-side policies as well as supply-side policies because both together will help accomplish the government's macroeconomic goals. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.